Okay, good afternoon. This is Wednesday, January 27. I've got a little class session for you here. I've got some exciting things to show you. Where we left off last time was basically getting ready to talk about spread of the data, how far out data can be spread. You know, you know the average, the mean, you know the median, the middle value, uh, there's another word called mode, which we'll practice today again too. Mode means the value that occurs most often. But if you have a bunch of friends and you ask them, you know, what's the, make a list of say, how much money do they have in their pocket and take the average, maybe the average amount of money they have in their pocket is 10 bucks talking cash. Maybe the average is 10 bucks, but maybe one of your friends has 100 bucks in his pocket. See, so average, middle, median, mode, those are useful words, but sometimes you'd like to know like, what's the spread of the data? What is the variation in the data? And that's what we're gonna start illustrating with an experiment right now. So let's say that I took, here's a very small experiment. And I asked you to talk to five friends and asked them how many hours did they game yesterday? And uh, I'm not picking on any particular idea or people here, you know, like my son games a lot. I used to game a lot when I had more time. So I'm not making any judgments about gaming or anything here, but let's just say you had a couple friends over or you were in a chat with some friends, you ask them, how many hours they gamed yesterday. And let's let that number be X. And let's just make up five numbers, six numbers off the top of our heads and pretend this is what they said. A couple of people said one, uh, two, three, three, and four. Let's say you had six friends and they said, this is what we gamed last night. You know lots of ways to present this data. We could find out what the middle value is. The median is literally the value in the middle. So between six people, that's easy to spot right here. That is between two and three, it's 2.5, but you could also count that by saying 0 0.5 times six plus one, seven people is 3.5. So you want between the third and the fourth place to get the median, right? And that's why I picked 2.5 because it's the average between the third and the fourth friend in that list in ascending order. Huh, what about mode? What is the number that appears most often? Well, one appeared twice, three appeared twice. If someone asks you for the mode, you say, hey, I got two modes. One, and three. When that happens, when you have a list of data and you're looking for the winner, who appeared most often? Maybe you don't have one winner. Maybe you got two people tied for most often. And here, the number of hours gamed yesterday, you had two people with one hour and two people with three hours. So those are the things that happen most frequently, but they're tied. When that happens, you can call this 
data by modal, which is just a fancy way of saying that there are two modes. But what's the mean of this data? The mean in this sense means the average. You have six friends and these are the total number of hours they gamed each. So you sum the values of X and you get, let's just sum these because they're right in front of us and it's a small number, two, four, four plus six is 10, 14. And then you divide by the number of friends that you asked, the number of people in your sample or your population. Here, the number of people that you asked was six. So 14 divided by six is two and one third. You know, 12 divided by six is two. I've got two left over. I could say two and one third. If you want me to pull this out to a couple decimal places, let's say 2.33. So let's look at these three numbers. 2.5, that's the middle number. One and three, that's the number of hours gamed that your friends most frequently said. Let's look at this number average, 2.33. That's the average number of hours that your friends gamed last night. We call that the mean. Let's say you wanted to describe your friends to someone else and uh, another person is an avid gamer. And so the first question they ask you is, oh, how many, how many hours? A night to your friend's game. Which number would you tell them? All of these numbers are valid. And maybe if you had a larger sample and these numbers were spread out more often, farther apart, maybe you might prefer one to the other. But in this case, I think all of these numbers do a good job of describing your average friend, so to speak. And remember, I'm just using gaming as an idea. If you don't like gaming, or if you want me to use another word, how about how many hot dogs did you eat yesterday? Well, the median number of hot dogs ate was 2.5. You had two friends that ate one hot dog and two friends that ate three hot dogs. So those are the modes. And on the average, your friends ate two and a third hot dogs. Notice this about the median and the mean, which we've already said. The median, the middle value is 2.5, but you and I both know that none of your friends ate two and a half hot dogs. Here's the list. The mean is two and a third, but none of your friends ate two and a third hot dogs. So remember, just because I say median doesn't mean it's one of the things that your someone one of your friends did. Mean, same thing. But now let's ask the new question. And then we're going to illustrate it in a fun way. Variation. All of your friends were different than the mean. None of your friends ate two and a third hot dogs. So the next question you're gonna ask yourself is like, well, how much did my friends vary from the mean? Now I could write a column here called mean. And then I could write a column that says, X minus mean. What would that do for me? I write the mean down. Now I'm not talking about mode or median now. I'm talking specifically about mean. 2.33, 2.33, 2.33, 2.33, 2.33. And I'm going to write down how much your friends were different from 2.33. Like this first friend was minus 1.33 from the mean. 
That means one minus 2.33 is minus 1.33. He was one and a third hot dogs or gaming hours. You know what? I'm going to just change it to hot dogs just so that people don't think I'm having something against gamers. How about the second friend? He was also one and a third hot dogs less than the average friend. Here's a friend who ate two hot dogs. He was less than the average, but only by a third. Here is a friend who ate three hot dogs. He ate 0 0.67 more than the average friend. So did this friend. 0 0.67 more. And this friend ate four hot dogs, 1.67 more. But you want to know how much your average friend is different, if there is such a thing as your average friend. You know, you told your, you told your mom, uh, my friends on average ate 2.33 hot dogs yesterday, some more, some less. And your mom said, well, was there anybody that ate 10 hot dogs? Was there anybody that ate no hot dogs? How much did your friends differ from the average? There's a problem here if you add up this sum. If you add up these numbers, and remember, I've definitely been rounding off but what happens if you add up the difference of your friend's number of hot dogs from the mean? Now, by the way, this has a name. This is called deviation, deviation. So what I'm doing is hitting this keyword right here. I wanna measure deviation. I wanna measure how far apart people are from the average. Well, the funny thing is, if you add up all these numbers, you're gonna get about zero. Now, because I rounded off, you won't get exactly zero, but look at this minus 133 and 33, that's 167. That cancels out that one. And, one six, and 067, 067 add up to about 134. That cancels out those two. All these deviations, cancel out. So it doesn't do any good to ask, what's the average deviation? Because yes, the average deviation from the middle has to be zero. That's what being the mean means. That's what being the average means. So instead of measuring deviation, we need to create something else that measures how far your friends are from the average. Now, the way we do that, and you will not do this by hand, but the way we do that is to square each of these deviations. And when I square them, that makes them all positive. Now in your mind, you're going to ask, like, why are you squaring them right now? Well, first of all, let's just do it, and then we'll ask why later. So this would be 1.7689, and I'm approximating, but notice the positive number, because when you square minus 1.33, you get a positive number. This is the same number here, so it's going to produce the same square. This is... 0.33, what happens when I square that? I get 0 0.1089, 0 0.67, when I square that, I get 0 0.4489, same 0 0.67, 0 0.4489 here. And finally, let's square 1.67. 27889. I am doing that on my calculator, but I'm not going to show you the calculator in front of you. 
Now, let's add up all these squares of differences. And that has a special name, but first let me add it up and then I'll tell you what the name is. So one, seven, six, sorry. I'm gonna add this up on my calculator again, but I'm not gonna show you that. I have two of those 1.769s. Then I have 0 0.18, uh, 1.089. But we will do this on the calculator in a second. Then I have two times 0 0.4489. And then I have this last number, which is a little larger, 27889. When I add these numbers together, I get 7.3336. Remember, I'm just approximating. When you add up these differences squared. Now in math, it's got a famous symbol. It's a capital Greek letter sigma. It looks like a funny E or looks like a backwards three. But when you add up the differences between the mean squared, that has a special name Sorry, I'm gonna move my paper down. It's called variance. And variance was one of the words we're talking about in that section. And now one more special word. If you take the variance, and how many friends did you have? six friends, you divide by the number of friends and you take the square root. That's called the standard deviation. Now there's two flavors of standard deviation. There's the population standard deviation for a whole population. And then there is what's called the sample standard deviation. You divide by N minus one. But first let's go back to our table and take this 7336 and divide by your six friends. Sorry. Take that answer on my calculator. I will show you how to do this on the calculator in a second. Take that answer and divide by your six friends and then take the square root. And I get 1.1056. Now that's if I divide it by N divided by six. This is called the population standard deviation and it's got a special symbol. It's got a symbol sigma. This is an uppercase sigma in Greek letters. This is a lowercase sigma, uppercase, lowercase. Looks like an O with a hat on it. And the sample standard deviation, we always use letter S. So what if I had taken that 73336 divided by N minus one and then taken the square root? So I'll do that on my calculator. So that means divide 73336 by five and then take the square root of that. And that's 1.2111. So what does the standard deviation tell you? 
It's not the deviation because the deviation, you can't take the average of. The deviation of all your friends from the middle was zero. But the standard deviation tells you about how much most of your friends are from the middle. Now remember the middle was 2.33. So standard deviation, let's subtract the sample 1.2 from 2.3. Then I get 1.1 or I get if I add 3.5. So most of your friends are between one and 3.5 hot dogs eaten yesterday. Not all your friends, most of your friends. Some of your friends went farther. You know, average value 2.33, standard deviation 1.2, that's 3.5. Here's one friend that went above the average deviation, above the average standard deviation. So we're saying this friend ate more hot dogs than you might expect your friends to eat. Okay, now let me, we did this in a table, but you can understand for a second, like if I had to do this with a hundred friends, it'd be a total mess or a thousand. So I need a calculator to do this for me. So I'm going to take this to the calculator, our screen calculator today, and I'm going to put in these data values and then have the calculator do the mean and the standard deviation for me. So let's do the experiment and see if I can show this to you on the calculator screen. Okay, I got my fancy new calculator right here. So I'm gonna do stat menu, edit, which is choice one. And I'm gonna put in the number of hot dogs my friend said they ate yesterday. One, one, two, three, four. Oh, it wasn't two, three, four. It was two, three, three, four. Okay, now I'm putting, I gotta learn how to run my calculator. One, one, two, three, three, oh, I, I think I'm typing too fast for the poor calculator. Two, three, three, four. Okay, I'm overdoing it with the buttons down here. But there's the list. Now, I liked making that table, it was fun, but if I was in a hurry, I wouldn't wanna write all that stuff down. So let's go to stat. We've done one variable statistics before, calculate. So go over to calculate and hit one variable statistics, number one. Calculator says, what do you want me to calculate? Which list? I've only got one list here, list one. I did not have a frequency list, just list one. So I just say list one, leave frequency list blank and say calculate. And here's the average. Do you see the average is two, three, three, just like we said, except the calculator used lots of decimal places. Do you see that some of all the hot dogs my friends ate yesterday was 14? Yeah, we did that. Do you see that I had six friends I surveyed? Yes. Uh, what was the median? 2.5, that's right. So what's the calculator done? The calculator has done all those calculations for me. And do you see here on the screen, it did the S, which is the sample standard deviation, 1.2111. It gave me more digits than I did. I rounded off at the fourth digit. And it gave me the population standard deviation, 1.1055. Now, your question is like gonna be, what's the difference between the sample standard deviation and the population standard deviation? 
that's a fancier thing we're going to talk about a lot later. But I'll give you some example today, but we'll talk a lot about it later. Right now, when you put the numbers in your calculator, someone's going to say to you, give me the sample standard deviation. And then you're going to pick this number s of x. OK? Now, I'm going to play with my calculator here. And I just want to show you blank, blank, that this numbers that I just did came from this list over here on the right side. The number of hot dogs my friend ate yesterday. Now let's pump this up big, big, big. I want to do it with a lot more friends. And I want to show you something else interesting. OK? But now you have at least the idea of what deviation, variance, and standard deviation mean. When someone asks you for standard deviation, make sure that you know which one to read on your calculator screen. Do they want the sample standard deviation or do they want the population standard deviation? Let me move my screen back to where it was. And let me show you another screen. Okay, so let's do another experiment, but with more people and no gaming and no hot dogs. But uh, let's go to an Excel spreadsheet. So first I want to share with you our weekly web page. Now this is right here, we're in week three. You handed in a homework last night and I'm still gonna read that for a while. I returned a homework to you yesterday as well. And at the beginning, I am being really, really picky about how you write and draw things because I want you to make sure you learn how to write and draw them correctly. But you handed in homework number two. Each week, you're going to get better at that. Now we're doing homework number three. And homework number three is posted if you want to uh, get started on that. You should get started on that right away, of course. So there's homework number three. Here's a question similar to the one we're doing now. And then here's a question about probability, which is the other thing you're practicing this week. So that's homework number three. But I want to show you something else on our web page. Down here under technology, I put a special spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet called sampling experiment. So if you click on that, spreadsheet. You can go to this Google Drive and download this spreadsheet. Now, uh, that's interesting. I'm in the browser Microsoft Edge. And right now, the Microsoft Edge browser wants to show me the spreadsheet. Don't look at a spreadsheet in a browser. Just download the spreadsheet and use Excel on your computer. OK, that, I didn't anticipate that, but I guess that's believable. Google Chrome would do the same thing. It would try to open the spreadsheet in a Google Drive or a Google spreadsheet, a Google Sheet, they call it. I'll fix that so it doesn't do that to you. But I've already downloaded and opened the spreadsheet, and I want to show you what it looks like. So I'm going to stop sharing this. And I'm going to go to share a spreadsheet with you. Now, I want to know, and this is going to be a little bit different because even though it's on your screen, I can see the numbers are kind of tiny. So I'll work with that. 
I'll pump that up. But in order to get the full effect of this, you're going to have to download the sheets yourself. So let's do an experiment. And I'll raise this a little bit so you can see what I wrote. You asked 20 of your friends, how much cash do you have in your pocket? Now, I don't know how you normally pay for stuff. You got a debit card, you got a credit card, you got uh, Google Pay on your phone. Uh, whatever you do, right? I do know this, people don't carry as much cash around with them in their pockets as they used to kind of, right? Used to make jokes about just having a coin full of, or a pocket full of coins, not a coin full of pockets, a pocket full of coins. But let's just pretend you asked 20 friends how much cash they had in their pockets and they responded to the nearest dollar. And here's what they said, your 20 friends, $3. Oh, here's someone with $15, $16, $21, $15, $22, $13, $8, $11, $4, $22. So these are all the numbers they gave you. And you decided to do the same experiment with the dollars that we just did with the hot dogs. I wonder what's the average amount of money my friends have in their pocket. I wonder what the standard deviation is. I wonder what the mean, median, and mode is. Now we're gonna be focusing on the mean, but you can still calculate the mean, median, and mode. Which number appeared most often? That's the mode. Now the trouble is I got a couple numbers. 15 appears twice. Uh, 17 appears twice. 22 appears two times, oh, three times. Does anybody beat three? The problem is this is a terrible way to do that because you might miss a number. You know what you're supposed to do. And let me shrink this so you can see it. What you're supposed to do is pretty much list your friends in order with the amount of money they have. That's what I'm gonna do right here. I've numbered your friends from one to 20. And I wrote down from least amount of money to most amount of money, what they have. So you can see that the most often was $22. That's the mode. But that's not a very good description of the middle, right? If you wanted to know about your average friend, does your average friend have $22 in their pocket? The answer is no, no. A couple people had $22, three people actually. But most of your friends had less than that. In fact, all the other friends had less than that. So the mode is three. It is the number that occurs most often, but it is not a good description of the middle. Okay, let's go for median. Median would be very easy in this case because for 20 people, the median is exactly in the middle between 10 and 11. And the average between 10 and 11 value the, the average of the 10th value and the 11th value is 15. So how about this? Does your average friend have $15 in their pocket? Eh, it's, a, it's a possibility. You've certainly got people on both sides of $15. Let's calculate the mean though. How do we calculate the mean? So what I did is I made this table in Excel do all the work for me. And I'm gonna shrink it so you can see what I asked the table to do. And I wanna see if I got enough room to do this. I'm gonna shrink it one more time. 
So I'm looking at my other screens just to make sure you can see these numbers. You can see the numbers, they are smaller, but let's just go with it. Let's just go with it. I'll shrink it one more time there. So let's just talk about all your friends right here. 20 friends. So I listed them, the amount of money they had in their pockets in order from smallest to largest. And there were 20 friends here. That's what I called N. I called it N sub X. X is like, how many dollars do you have in your pocket? So N is how many people did I ask? I asked 20 people. How do I find the average amount of money they have in their pocket? Well, I will add up all the money among them. I did add up all that money that you see there and I got $284. So that is the sum of all the money they have. They could pull their money. Oh, they could buy a decent TV. But then they'd have to figure out how to share it for 20 people. Okay, how do you do the mean? All you do is take the total amount of money they have divided by the total number of people involved. And that's 14.2. So that's what I call right here the mean. So what do I want to know? 14.2, the median was 15. So the median was a little larger than the mean. What's the average amount of money my friends have in their pocket? $14.20. I rounded off the two decimal places because cents is a very ordinary way to talk about money. But now let's go and look at the deviations again. How about this person that only had $3? Well, he has got $11.20 less than the average. What about the person that has $4? She has $10.20 less than the average. I just told the Excel spreadsheet to calculate four minus 14. I did that with a formula called <coughs> C19 minus D19. C19 is the blue cell, D19 is the red cell. And then I told the spreadsheet to do that all the way down. Let's look at friend number 15. She had $17 in her pocket. The average is $14.20. So she has $2.80 more than average. But do you see my problem? I cannot add up all these averages. And remember, these averages are called the deviation. Adding up these deviations just gives me a zero. Now, on the bottom of the screen, you can see some zero, where I put my pointer about right now, down here, near the lower right-hand side. Over here in this box, I summed the deviation too, and it says minus 2.49 E minus 14. What does that mean? It means that the machine was rounding off and it's got what's fancily called scientific notation. This is 0 0.0000000000 down to 14 decimal places with a little bit left over. So you know that when you add a column, you get some rounding off probably, right? So here, the table is telling me that it rounded off to be nearly zero. I wonder if I could get rid of that scientific notation. Do you see Excel calls that scientific notation? Let's just make it a number. Okay, I should have done that from the start. All the deviations sum to zero, but now let's do the squares of the deviations. What happens when you square 11.2? You get 125.44 probably, 
Well, you do get 125.44. I didn't do that. I told Excel to square the element in cell E18. And all the way down the line, I told Excel, well, let's not do that. I told Excel to just square each of the deviations. And then I'll take the average. Now, when I did that, I got adding all these people up, I got 607.2000. And when I take that and divide by 20, remember you got 20 friends. So the variance is the 607.2000. The variance is the sum of the squares of the deviations. But I want the average deviation, not the average deviation squared. So I'll take divide by six, I'm sorry, divide by 20. So 600 approximately divided by 20 is about 30. And then I will take the square root of that 30 and get 30.3600 square rooted here is the standard deviations S and sigma. This is the population standard deviation. This is what's called the sample standard deviation. Let's say that this was all your friends in the world, which is 20, which is pretty good. So this is the population of all your friends in the whole world. And basically most of your friends are at that average of $14 in their pocket with a standard deviation of $5.50. So that is what most of your friends. What's 1420 minus 5.5? Uh, that would be about uh, 870. So a little more than $8. What's 1420 plus 5.5? That's 19.7. That's pretty far up there. So look at a great block of your friends. How many is that? That's 12 of your 20 friends. And 12 of 20 is what? Six out of 10? In this example, about 60% of your friends are within one standard deviation. How about two standard deviations? You know, one standard deviation is kind of like ordinary. Are there any of your friends who got way too much money or way too little money? What's two standard deviations? Let's take two times 5.5, that's $11. Let's add $11 and subtract $11 from the average. So subtract 11, I'd have $3.20. Add 11. I'd have $25.20. Now let's check this out. Do you see that almost all of your friends are within two standard deviations of the average? That's actually important. Like if I wanna know if there are any outliers or are there any strange cases, <coughs> look at this one friend with only $3. He is, far away from the average. And your mom asks you, how far away? And you say, he is more than two standard deviations away. What I could do is take the dollars, he's got $3. I could take the average, which is $14.20. And I could find out how many standard deviations he's away by doing this formula. 
You see the formula I did here. I took three minus 14.2, that's C18 minus D18. And then I divided by the population standard deviation, which was 5.5. And I found out that he was two standard deviations away. In fact, 2.03, he was more than two standard deviations away. <clears throat> and then I was curious, so I did it for all my friends. Let's look at this friend number 10. She's got $15 in her pocket. The average is 14.2. She is very close to the average. How close? She is only 0.15 standard deviations away. 15% of a single standard deviation. When you ask this question, how many standard deviations are you away from the average? People have a fancy name for that. They call it the Z-score. If you ever hear someone say Z-score, which you will in this chapter and a lot in the future, Z-score means how many standard deviations are they away from the average? Now you have to make sure you know whether they're asking you for sample standard deviation or pop population standard deviation. Okay, so I've thrown a lot at you right there, but now I've explained in a way what deviation and variance are. That's not something I look at a lot, but standard deviation is gonna be big, big, big for us. Standard deviation is a very good way to tell how far away from the normal someone is. What's the normal amount of money your friends have in your pocket? Normal, mean, average, $14.20. This friend with only $3 in his pocket, he is definitely not one of your normal friends. All these people within one standard deviation. Now, I don't mean normal friends like he's not a nice person or he's not psychologically normal. I mean, most of your friends have more money in their pocket. Okay, I'm gonna play one more game with you, and this is gonna be fun. Do you see here that I made the same table over here on the right-hand side, but I've colored that table blue. So let's do an experiment. Let's say you do have 20 friends, but they're not all hanging out with you right now. Wherever you're hanging out. And right now there's not a lot of places to hang out, I understand. Pizza, bowling, baseball game, whatever. Let's just say you have five of your friends with you right now. And you didn't pick and choose. These are just the five people that could come to the baseball game with you. I've got a funny question for you. So listen really carefully. I know you have 20 friends, but right now at the baseball game, there's only five of them sitting with you. What if you asked those five how much money they have in their pocket? You could do the calculations we just did, no problem. It would be easier because there's less people to ask. I'm just gonna let the calculator do it for me or the computer here in the Excel spreadsheet. But here's the funny question. If I just ask five people, five of my friends randomly, will I get good information about all of my friends? Think about that. You know you got 20 friends. You don't have time to ask them all because they're not here right now. Let's just ask five of your friends. And then we're gonna say this. Uh, these five friends, I just chose them randomly today. They just happen to be available for the baseball game. 
I'm going to use their average money to guess how much average money my friends have in their pocket overall. Okay, here, let's do that. And let me show you how to do it. So I've got your 20 friends listed here, right? But I don't want to be prejudiced about which ones I pick. So I'm going to pick five at random. But I do not trust myself to pick randomly. So I'm going to ask the calculator to pick five random numbers. Let me show you on our nice computer calculator how to do that. So I'm going to go back and share my calculator screen. If I can find it, there it is. Now you're looking at my calculator screen. I showed you this once before, and the book shows it to you, but maybe you forgot it. Look under the math button. So here's a record of the buttons I'm going to use. Look under the math button. Look under probability. So just arrow over to probability. And look at this random, random integer, random integer with no repeats. Number eight. Let's try that. And the calculator asks you, you're going to choose numbers from what to what? You say from 1 to 20. How many numbers do you want to pick, the calculator says. You say five. And now the calculator is going to pick five of your friends out at random. If I hit the return button or the enter button right now. Okay, calculator says, okay, let's do 19, 3, 11, 9, and 15. I'm going to write these down on my paper so I can move to the other screen. I'm going to choose friend 19, friend 3, friend 11, friend 9, and friend 15. Let's go back to our Excel spreadsheet. I wrote those on my paper just so I wouldn't forget but you don't have to write them down. I'm gonna go back to my Excel spreadsheet, which is right here. I'm gonna share that with you. It's right there. Uh, nope, that's not my Excel spreadsheet, sorry. Like I said, I've got too many windows here. Okay, what I got to do is get rid of this calculator first. Now, let's try to find the Excel spreadsheet. Got it. Okay, maybe you were experiencing something different than I was, but I was having a problem. Okay, so let's pick out friends 19, 3, 11, 9, and 15. I'm going to make those red. Then I'm going to erase the other friends. What I'm saying is they're not at the baseball game with me right now. And let's see what happens. Now, do you see up in the upper part of this sheet, I have the calculator going like it was our hand calculator. But when I delete those other friends who aren't at the baseball game with me, here's what I have. Just five friends, and the amount of money they have in their pocket is $8, $14, $15, $17, $22. But look at the average. The mean is $15.20. You know what? That's darn close to what you knew the whole mean of your friends was. Your friends were $14.20 average, but these five with you at the baseball game are $15.20. Let's pretend you don't have time to go ask 20 friends. You just did a sample and you learned that the friends with you have $15.20. Would it be so wrong to say that all your friends have $15.20 on average? 
Well, sure, it would be wrong. But do you see that it's not far from what it really was? Let's look at the standard deviation. Let's look at the sample standard deviation. For this sample, the standard deviation was $5.10. What was the population standard deviation? $5.50. Do you see that the spread of your sample is about the same as the spread of all your friends? Now, this is really interesting. So what does that mean? I didn't have to ask my 20 friends. I could have just sampled them. Now, remember, I had to choose a good sample, right? I had to choose an honest sample, a fair sample. What would have happened? Let me back this up. If I would have just chose the five poorest friends, and blocked out all the others. Well, then I would get the impression that my friends only got $6.60 in their pocket. But that's only true of my five friends that had the least money. Let me back that up. What if I had taken the five friends that had the most money and got rid of everybody else? That's not a good idea because now I think all my friends have $21 in their pocket. And really, they have far less than that. This idea that I could randomly pick my friends, I could randomly pick five of my friends, and I could make a good judgment about all the rest of my friends. First time you hear it, that's unbelievable. Let's try it five friends again at random. I'm just going to run my calculator and say, Pick five friends at random. I'm not going to show it to you. I'll just report what it said. This time the calculator picks friend number two, friend number 18, friend number 15, friend number six, and friend number nine. Let's make all those friends red. And then let's get rid of the other friends. Get rid of means I just am not asking them, not getting rid of them in some mean sense. Check this out. What is the average amount of money of these five random friends in their pocket? $13.60. That's not the true average amount of money in my friend's pocket, but it's darn close. Look at the standard deviation, 6.7. Now, $6.70, 73 cents difference for one standard deviation. Here it was $5.51 difference for one standard deviation. That's not as close as I'd like it to be, but it's still close. It's still in the ballpark, right? Let me do it one more time because the first time you see this, it sounds way too magical. This time the calculator picked friend number 16, friend number five, friend number one. Oh, that was a bad idea because he's got the least money. No, 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 I'm choosing randomly. So I'm not being prejudiced against one or another. Let's see what I got. I'll erase all the other friends. And here's my average, $11.80. That is not really good compared to my 1420. It's in the ballpark, but it's not as accurate as I might hope. What about standard deviation? Sample standard deviation is 5.84. The Population standard deviation was 5.51. That's pretty close. 
now I want you to do one more thought experiment with me before we talk about something else. Oh, and by the way, you can download the spreadsheet and do this yourself. You can play with it yourself if you like. Now, if you download the spreadsheet and you like erase something, mess it up, you don't have to worry because you're not gonna damage my spreadsheet. And you could just re-download the spreadsheet that was linked to on my webpage, okay? So if you break something, don't worry about it, just download another copy. Or ask me what you broke. I mean, you could send me the spreadsheet, I'll tell you what got broken. But let me go backwards on my spreadsheet here. Let me put back all 20 friends. So I'm gonna sample five friends. And what did I learn? Sometimes I was close to the real truth. Sometimes I was farther away from the real truth. Sometimes I was above the real truth. Sometimes I was below the real truth. So I wonder if I did this five friend experiment many, many, many times. Would it be just as good as asking my 20 friends? Now you say, well, if you did the five friend experiment four times, you might as well just ask your 20 friends. I say, you're right. But what if we pumped it up from 20 friends to 20,000 friends? How about 100,000 friends? How many of them would you have to ask before you believed that you knew the average of all 100,000 friends? Think about that for a second. So first thing you're saying is, I don't have 100,000 friends. Okay, maybe on social media, you might have a lot of friends. I'm not talking about social media. I'm talking about actual people you could talk to and say, turn out your pockets. But how about this? Instead of 100,000 friends, let's say you go to a football game at the University of Michigan. How many people are in the stands? Well, you know, it varies by the day, but I think their capacity is over 100,000. It's like 105,000. And then they put in those fancy luxury boxes for your very wealthy friends. I, maybe it's 110 or something. I, I have no idea, but let's just pretend that at the University of Michigan's football stadium, you have 100,000 friends. There is no way you can ask them all how much money they have in their pockets. But you know what you could do? You could do a stratified sample. 100,000 people there, but I think there's only like how many sections in the stadium? Are there 50 sections in the stadium? What if you picked one person out of every section? Randomly, with those 50 people, could you make a guess about how much money is in everyone's pocket in the stadium on average? The very wild answer is yes, you can as long as you're doing it honestly, randomly. What about a cluster sample? We got 50 sections in the stadium, right? Why don't we choose five of those sections and survey everybody? Now you have to choose those five sections randomly, right? You wouldn't pick the five sections that are only occupied by the students. They would probably have less money in their pockets you wouldn't pick the five sections that are all on the 50 yard line. You know those tickets are more expensive and the people on the 50 yard line probably have more money in the pockets. But what if you picked five sections from the stadium at random? That's called a cluster sample. And then you sampled everybody in those five sections. Would that be good enough to tell you about the whole stadium population? 
And the crazy, crazy answer is, yes, it would. Now, I got to make this impression on you before we move on to the next topic. You've heard the saying, like, never say never. You know, like, nothing is certain, right? So when I say, yes, it would be good enough, or when I say, oh, I only had to ask five of my friends. What I was really saying was, I could ask five of my friends if I wanted to approximate, if I wanted to know roughly how much money they had in their pockets. I could just survey at Michigan Stadium 50 of the 1,000 people and as long as I did it randomly, I would get a good idea of how much money is in their pockets on average. I did not say I will know exactly how much money is in their pockets. I said I would have a good approximation, a good idea. So then your next question then is naturally this, how good? You're gonna say, well, you're like some kind of wizard. I want to hire you. I want to take you down to gas station and we're going to play the lottery. I say, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I didn't say I was good at that. I just said I was good at doing math. So whenever someone says they're good at something, right? Before you actually put money on them, before you actually trust them, Oh, I'm good at fixing cars. Before you actually give them their car, you want to know how good, right? I tell you what, I am good at fixing cars. Uh, but I'm, but let me tell you what I'm good at. I'm good at changing the headlight bulbs. I'm good at replacing the windshield wipers. I am not good at changing the oil. I just don't do it, right? So you understand that when someone uses the word good, your next question is how good? Now, what I want you to do is take this example that I gave you or make up your own and put it into your calculator so you can practice taking the sample population standard deviation, sample standard deviation, population standard deviation, mean, quartiles. You know, your calculator is like a practice buddy. You can do the calculations, and then you can ask your calculator if you got it right, okay? Now I'm gonna go on to another topic entirely. And I don't want you to get hung up on like, how did he create all those numbers? I let the calculator create the numbers for me. What I want you to get hung up on is, wow, is that really possible? Can we really do that? So let's focus on these words like z-score and standard deviation, s or sigma. Read that sections two, five, two, six, two, seven carefully then you'll understand better what we mean by those words. At first, we're going to calculate, then later we'll get more serious. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing the spreadsheet. You can download it from the website if you like. I'm going to go back to our paper. And I'm going to say just a few words in the end about these last two topics. Probability and independent and mutually exclusive events. Oh, I didn't bring a deck of cards with me. I wanted to have a deck of cards with me. Well, I don't. So next time I'll have a deck of cards handy. But let's understand what probability is and let's understand what independent and mutually exclusive events are. Probability. In the very simplest form is just someone asking, 
how likely Your average friend had $14.20 in their pocket. How likely that one of your friends has less than $5? It wasn't very likely. Most of your friends had more than $5. Your average friend has $14.20 in your pocket. How likely is that a friend you pick out at random has at least 15, and that means 15 or more. Actually, that was very likely because the middle number was 15. So half of your friends had $15 or more. Probability is how likely. And if you think about the experiment we just did, if I say to you, if I pick five friends at random, how likely is it that they give me a good picture of the money in your pocket of all of your friends? How likely? And when I ask that, I'm asking a probability question. What are the odds that five friends are good enough to estimate? So you see that when we do sampling, we're going to have to ask a question like how likely? How good? And that's probability. So let me give you a very simple probability example. Let's look at a standard, and then we're going to have to call it a day. So you can read these two sections yourself. These first warm-up sections here in Chapter 3 are not complicated. So you can read them and get back to me with any questions you like. How about a standard 52-card deck, a deck of playing cards? And maybe you play with playing cards, maybe you don't but I'll tell you what a standard 52 card deck of playing cards looks like. You got an ace, you got a two, you got a three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is why I should have had a deck with me. You got your tens and you got jack, queen and king. I'm just gonna use those single letters or numbers to represent what people call the values of the playing cards. And I'm not gonna make any judgment like is ace a low value or is ace a high value? It's just a value. You know games that you can do with playing cards where ace is worth more than a king. Or ace can be worth one under certain circumstances. So let's not talk about a game. I'm just talking about the deck of cards. You also know that the cards in the deck are colored red and blue. And they have something called suits, which are clubs, diamonds, hearts, and spades. Now, clubs and diamonds, the club cards are all black. The diamond cards are all red. The heart cards are all red and the spade cards are all black. So these are the colors of the cards. These are the suits in card language. But here, I just want you to look at these 52 cards with me. Every one of these boxes on my paper represents a card. Like this box here is the four of clubs. And this box here is the jack of hearts. I have four aces, four twos, four threes, four jacks, four kings, four of everybody. So I could ask you a very simple question. Like, if I picked a card at random, what's the probability that I pick a king? 
and you would respond pretty naturally. There are 52 cards in the deck. Four of them are kings. I have a four in 52 chance of choosing a king. Now you could do math on that, like four goes into 52 13 times. I'm not saying you should do it that way. I'm just going to find out what four divided by 52 is. Zero, seven, six, nine. You have a 7.69% chance of picking a king. Not great. But what's the probability of picking a numbered card? Well, you got a whole pile of numbered cards. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine numbered cards, four of each. There are 36 numbered cards out of 52 cards. Let's see what decimal that is. 69.2%. At the carnival, if you had your choice between playing, let's pick a king, or let's pick a numbered card. I think you're gonna play the second game. Let's pick a numbered card. Let me try two more things on you. What is the probability of picking a king if I tell you that you picked a red card? This is where I need a deck of cards in my hand. Let's say I lay a card down. And this is not a playing card, but let's pretend that's a playing card. And I ask you, what's the probability of getting a king? You win if you picked a king. And I'm going to look under this thing for a second without showing you. And I say, oh, guess what? Your card is red. Your card is red. Does that change whether you think you got a king here or not? Let's try it out. The probability of getting king in general is four out of 52. But what's the probability of getting king if you picked a red card? How many red cards are in the deck? 13 values, two, out of, half of them are red. So there's 26 red cards. But now how many of the kings are red? Only the king of diamonds and the king of hearts. So, Something is wrong with my phone, possibly, but we'll have to see about that later. Okay, I'm not too worried about it. Uh, two kings out of 26. But do you understand two out of 26 is one out of 13? And what's two out of 26? It's still 0 0.076. Do you know what? It didn't matter that you picked a red card. That doesn't help you and it doesn't hurt you. And when that happens, that these two events, that knowing one event does not change the probability of the other event, then these events are called independent events. How about what's the probability of you picking a king and a numbered card with the same card What's the probability that this card right here is a king and it's got a number on it? Well, you say you're crazy. The kings don't have numbers on them. You're right. So when two things cannot happen at once, that is called mutually exclusive. So the words you're learning in this sections, first, Mutually exclusive 
and independent. Independent means the probability of one does not affect the probability of the other. Mutually exclusive means it's impossible for them to happen at the same time. Now, what if I told you what's the probability of picking a king given that you do not have a numbered card? Now, all of a sudden, you're very happy. Here's your card. I look under it and say, oh, it's not a numbered card. Do you understand your probability of getting a king just went up, right? Because you took away all these bad ones. How many cards are not numbered? Aces, jacks, queens, kings. 16 cards are not numbered. How many cards among those 16 are kings? Four. Now you have a one in four chance of getting a king. You have a 25% chance of getting a king. And before you only had a 7.6% chance of getting a king. You've more than tripled your chance. What does that mean? These events are dependent. That knowing that you did not have a numbered card changed the probability of getting a king. Okay, we're going to talk about probability all next week. But this is just a quick snap through a couple words. And we can do more later. Uh, what I'm going to do right now is wrap this up because I got to go to see another class. But thank you for coming. I'll upload this as soon as possible. And uh, play around with this. Play around with some probability problems. Get started on the next homework. Make sure you're working inside the Newton Alta system too, just to reinforce everything we're talking about here. The problems aren't hard to do, and they give you a lot of help. But you got to get started on those. Don't save those for the last minute. I'm going to stop here and get going to another place. But you guys have a good weekend.